Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And I'm sorry to do this uh, in English. Um, I'll join the panel afterwards and happily speak, uh, uh, speak German. Um, but I prefer to do the talk in English. I'll try not to talk too fast. And I'll try to keep vaguely on time. But in order to do that, I'll also take my phone out to make sure. 37, very good. Um, you've had two introductions, philosophical big picture, legal details. Um, I'm the journalist, so I have to do nuts and bolts. All my career at The Economist and the Financial Times, I used to have people after interviews saying, oh, come on, you journalists, all you want to hear is the bad news. You just want to write bad things about my, pa my party, about my company, about my country. Uh, about my town, uh, let's be honest. And I would spend all my career, literally nearly 30 years, saying, no, it's not true. We're just trying to do a balanced job. We're trying to give the big picture, the good and the bad. But frankly, whether it's because of reaching a certain age or two years ago becoming a freelance journalist, you tell me, it's true. We do like to write about bad things. Bad things are interesting. People like reading bad things. Um, unfortunately, especially in a more competitive media landscape, bad things help sell newspapers or radio listening. You name it. It's, it's sadly true. Why do I say this by way of introduction? Because, frankly, 2015 provided plenty of bad news, and I fear 2016 promises much more. My title is Europe's Crises, Grexit, Brexit and Co. I'm certainly going to mention Grexit and Brexit, but I'm going to probably talk rather longer about and Co. because I think we've got rather a lot. I'm sorry to be the doomsday guy um, on this morning's uh, event. Uh, I'd love to do something else, but I'll try at the very end maybe to find a little bit of positive. Um, very quickly, 2015 and what's coming forwards, um, in no particular order, and I'm just going to run through the catalog. Terrorism security, obviously the Paris events of November, we hope improved security uh, is going to protect us, we have no idea, we fear there may be more to come. The refugee crisis and perhaps immigration in general. The Syrian situation as you see every day in the news is not getting better and indeed seems to be getting significantly worse. In Germany, I hardly need to tell you about issues related to refugees. Uh, I think only of Cologne and New Year's Eve. I did a presse club um, the following Sunday, I think it was, and I just wandered around the Cologne Bahnhofsplatz before the recording, before the program, uh, to see if there was any difference. I didn't really notice any difference. Perhaps there was one more police car, but um, obviously that shocked people. And then the broader issue linked to migration and refugees, the whole pressure on the Schengen system. We've just had an Austrian speaker. Obviously, uh, the Austrian government has been mentioning quotas and talking about walls. Other people have talked about walls and indeed built them. We're only in February. Imagine what's going to happen come the summer. Um, the refugee issue has polarized Europe, um, particularly from an east-west point of view, to a slightly less extent from a north-south point of view, and perhaps the most imagine unimaginable thing of all. We've mentioned Grexit, we've mentioned Brexit. I heard, maybe it's a common expression already in Germany, I'm sorry if you know it, the first time the other day, Megxit, Merkel exit. Anthony Glees referred last night to Empress of Europe. I'm not suggesting this is something that's going to happen. I won't tell you who I heard this from, but someone so close to the German seat of power. Um, I found it uh, extraordinary. But the fact that this could even be, as you know better than me, a subject of potential discussion uh, is, I think, quite uh, amazing if one thinks of the climate just a few months ago. Keep an eye on the time. Um, that's politics. Economic tensions, well, there is many of those ahead of us. Um, we still have the repercussions of the 2008 financial crisis. Unemployment, especially in peripheral countries and especially amongst younger people, the so-called lost generation. Um, unsustainable, or at least very heavy, debt burdens in some member states. I think you might hear more about that later on today. And we have unresolved errors, flaws, 
emissions in some of the um, legal work that created the Eurozone. Uh, the idea was, was excellent, uh, but obviously there were things left out in terms of fiscal union, in terms of closer cooperation, in terms of bank supervision, deposit guarantees. The list is endless and we're seeing some of those legacies today. Finally, perhaps on, on the big picture, threats, geopolitics. I've concentrated up till now on the EU, but um, tensions with Russia. Uh, the situation in Ukraine, at least in terms of fighting, has eased, but it could come back. We know the Ukrainian government, we know, is exceptionally unstable. There's even suggestions, of course, that Russia is deliberately fomenting discontent in the EU as part of a much bigger grand strategy that a weaker EU, a divided EU, is in Russians, Russia's interest. All these issues, of course, have also focused internally in the EU on internal pressures, and the most obvious one being, again, focusing on Germany, uh, the fact that Germany's role is being increasingly questioned. Interesting subject to debate last night, whether Germany should be doing more. Perhaps we'll have time to debate it further. Um, but the fact that not just countries under economic pressure, Greece and some of the southern peripheral countries, Italy too, are questioning Germany's role, but also, of course, Eastern European countries, the Poles, the Hungarians. I mean, this is obviously not at all healthy for the EU. Um, what's been the result of all this? How has it been expressed? Well, uh, this and perhaps the broader anxieties triggered by globalization, um, hardly a new phenomenon, being expressed through rising populism. Um, we've seen it, ultra-conservative parties, notably in France, Hungary, Poland, but we've also seen sharp rises of left-wing populism, Greece, Portugal, Spain. Um, what's that left us? In some cases, governments that are not in a very good position to take decisions, obviously essential to take decisions at times like these. Denmark, Sweden, Spain, we don't know what's happening. Um, very uneasy coalitions. On top of all of that, we have our friends the British, who um, obviously have been um, trying to resolve their own problems, uh, domestic political problems um, through the renegotiation. I'll come on to it in a second. But that's added to this really very uneasy outlook for Europe. What's my prognosis? I'm sorry to say, I don't think it's very rosy. I fear ever more tension, and I really don't see any let up in some of these external circumstances um, that I've listed. On the economic side, I guess you could say the fall in um, the oil price is positive, at least it is in theory, but things now seem to be so interconnected that actually um, there seems to have uh, been as a result a crisis in investor confidence, a huge rise in volatility on financial and uh, commodity markets, um, and obviously uh, deflationary fears have, incre have, have risen um, extraordinary monetary policies, whether at the ECB or individual countries moving to negative interest rates, taking us really into uncharted economic territory. On top of that, the big question over China. Clearly, we could have a huge discussion just on China. Yes, it's still growing, but the fact that the rate of growth seems to be decreasing and we don't really trust the, the statistics have led to a, a major crisis of confidence. Finally, perhaps, the geopolitical big picture, before I move to the next bit. Um, Ukraine-Russia seems to have eased, but we don't know where it may be going. Iran has come back into the fold a bit, but there's still an awful lot of Ayatollahs out there doing goodness knows what. And what North Korea is up to is obviously anybody's guess. Um, okay. Marginal relaxation, I haven't seen the details, but the negotiations last night over Britain seem to have gone broadly successfully. However, whether the compromise, which I suspect we all imagined was going to come, um, is adequate or not, uh, for the British Eurosceptics remains to be seen. Referenda, I'm living in Switzerland now, so I should approve of them, um, and I do in principle, but are dangerous things because um, we're all subject to emotions 
and this is an extremely emotional issue. So I'm not going to dare to predict what will happen in Britain if there's a referendum called in June. I'd like to think Britain will see sense and stay in, but emotions, as I say, and passions are dangerous things. Finally, um, the Greek situation, uh, it, we have a strange government, but it looks like it's doing what at least its creditors want. However, the biggest issue of all pensions reform has been pushed back and pushed back, and we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and equally, Greece's hopes of having some relief on its massive debts, some forgiveness, uh, have yet to be recognized. Um, I'm a convinced European. Um, uh, you heard I did my doctorate on French and German politics. I've worked in the European continent virtually all my career. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a bleaker outlook at any time. Um, and if one thinks that the euphoria that there was at the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Eastern European return to the fold, it seems light years away to me now. Do I have anything at all positive to say? Well, not much. Um, I'm trying to find a silver lining in this cloud. And the, about the only thing I can see is the extent of the crisis, especially over identity and sovereignty issues, seems to have led to a greater realization, appreciation that um, we have to confront realities, confront taboos, and perhaps reconsider our former political correctness. Don't misunderstand, I'm not suggesting uh, we should dilute European ideals like civil liberties, uh, but perhaps we have to be more truthful than we've been in the past about um, recognizing that we're not necessarily all the same, and that while other people's values may deserve our respect, we are fully entitled to disagree with them, and if necessary, even to override them in appropriate circumstances. I know these are dangerous thoughts, but I think uh, it's important to recognize those realities. In Switzerland, where I live, um, there's uh, an ultra-conservative party, which is by far the dominant party. I don't like all the things they say, and I certainly don't like the way they say them. But the fact that they bring to the surface things that probably many people feel but are reluctant to express is probably on balance a good thing. I think what we've got to recognize is we can't just brush aside people's political anxieties, whether it's about foreigners, whether it's about losing their jobs, whether it's about competition. I think we've got to be willing, and this is already happening, even in Germany, to confront some of the less agreeable problems raised by issues like immigration and integration. And we've got to acknowledge the anxieties that have led to the rise of populism, rather than plastering over the cracks, talking endlessly about mutual respect and things like that. Um, as I say, I have no answers. Perhaps it's just briefly, though, um, helpful to look at for a second some of the factors that may have contributed to all of this. I've mentioned globalization. Obviously, we can't hold the clock back. We can't stop the internet. That's happened. Uh, but we are under a sort of pressure now that we never used to be before. We've recognized and welcomed the um, enlargement of the EU. I certainly have from its original uh, members. Um, but maybe, in retrospect, we have to admit that things went a little bit too fast for many European citizens, and that perhaps uh, if we'd been slower, it might have been to everyone's advantage. I'm not suggesting there is this nostalgia movement out there that the best EU would be the one of the original six, but um, maybe there's a lesson there. I'm also wondering if there's a lesson, albeit retrospective, that we've been too ambitious and idealistic in pushing ahead ever greater union, and that actually we should have recognized earlier that actually member states aren't the same, that they should be treated differently, and uh, that we have to take that into account as we move forwards. Um, I recognize 
my own academic work way back when, that the EU has actually grown out of crises. I'd like to think that there will be useful lessons to learn out of the current crises, although I'm, as I say, pessimism. Sorry. That's my timer reminding me I should stop. I hope there are lessons to be learned out of the current crisis, but I think we have to recognize that a multi-speed EU is now inevitable. And perhaps just to close, um, I started by talking about the media and that admitting late in my career that we journalists like focusing on bad news because bad news sells. Uh, this is a conundrum for me. I don't have an answer, but I throw the um, thought in, especially to an event that's multidisciplinary, taking in culture and media, as well as politics, economics, and the law. The EU story has always been a very difficult story to sell. It's always been easier to write about the Brussels bureaucracy, fairly or unfairly, than talk about successes. It's always been easier to find idiotic things like individual olive oil bottles in restaurants than big things that have helped us all. Um, that's a fact. But I think, especially in times as troubled as these, we've got to look for ways, especially the media, but not exclusively uh, our politicians, of trying to highlight the achievements and successes of Europe since 1945. I mean, you know, it, it, seems, it seems unnecessary because we take them so for granted. Peace and freedom, cooperation between nations, the rule of law, the protection of human rights the advantages that have come through the promotion of free trade. I fear I'm not going to get on the front page of any newspaper in any language um, extolling uh, those things. But I, I do wonder if there's some way our media, our politicians can remind people more, obviously in an authentic way, not in an artificial way, of how we've benefited from European integration and what it's brought us rather than understandably at the moment, focusing so much on our divisions and on our differences. Thank you very much.